Next from Springfield, Ralph Martiri, the executive director of the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, discusses steps the state can take to fix its broken budget and why he says simply cutting taxes isn't one of them. This runs about 55 minutes. Hi, good morning. So, a word of caution. My entire presentation is based on a rational approach to the budget. <laughs> and what you're gonna hear at noon will be something other than a rational approach to the budget. You know, that said, it, it's really interesting to me. I have been working with Mike Jacoby, and thank you for those kind words, Mike. He's really one of the true leaders in education in Illinois and America. His focus, you know, he represented as a superintendent one of the more affluent districts in Illinois that didn't benefit from major structural education reforms, yet Mike went out in the forefront and fought for those kinds of things because it's the right thing to do for public education. And as we look at Illinois' problems, and my organization has consistently been trying to take the fiscal side of the ledger and tie it to the service delivery side and make some sort of sensible connection there, what is most galling is that the solutions to our problem are eminently attainable and affordable. Indeed, if our state were to tax itself about four to four and a half billion dollars more than it does, or than it did, I should say, before the phase down of the temporary tax increase on January 1, we could solve all our problems. And by solving all our problems, I mean eliminate the structural deficit, pay all our bills, put about $200 million back into social services, which have been cut brutally over the last few years and will be cut brutally again today. And oh, by the way, two or three years after that, get up to funding education at about four to five billion more than we put into it today, which is what the evidence-based model says we should do. And that tax increase, four billion, sounds like a lot of money, right? It's less than 1% of our $700 billion state economy. We just can't allow that, that very small tax increase, to stand in the way of actually solving our problems. So with all that happiness, I thought I'd bring some to today's presentation. I've always been accused of not having enough sunshine in my presentations, all doom and gloom. There you go, and now I'm done with that. Here's our current state budget, FY 2015. It's got two major parts. You, you look at the, the first part, it says total hard costs. Those are the things that by law, the state has to pay no discretion. And it's really three items, right? It's our pension contribution, it's our debt service, and it's something called statutory transfers out. Biggest ones of those required by law transfers from the general fund to other things are, are two items. Our Medicaid transfers, that's over a billion of that, which is a jointly funded state federal program. And another billion in change of that is the local government distributive fund, which Governor Rauner is going to suggest cutting, by the way, today. And those are the two biggest pieces there. You move down from that, and there's the area of the budget, which is about 25 billion or so of the 35 billion, where the state has a little bit of discretion, but not as much as you would think. And this is where the state spends its money by, by making a vote. There's a general uh, election, excuse me, there's a general decision made by legislators that are going to prioritize some money to education or healthcare, whatever. If you look at those categories, nine out of ten dollars go to education, health, social services, and public safety. That's where our general fund gets spent, right? Now, it's not all discretionary. Once again, Medicaid is a big chunk of this so that you can't cut Medicaid without the federal government approving it. So that takes about six or seven billion dollars off from your ability to cut. Not every human service can be just unilaterally cut. There are some court orders out there about limits on caseloads, et cetera, and our prison systems just can't be unilaterally cut. In fact, if you looked at our pres prison systems in Illinois today, we have one of the worst overcrowding situations of any state in the nation. So what's that leave to cut? It leaves education and social services. 
And really, that's what we're going to see bearing the brunt of the cuts in this budget, social services, and in particular, higher education. And we know that's coming our way. Now, we had $35 billion in revenue for your budget, but I have to say, we didn't really. About a billion of that $35 billion was manufactured. It was borrowed revenue. It was moving costs from one year to another, et cetera. So it looks like we have more revenue this year than we did. We have $10.8 billion in hard costs, and we had a deficit carry forward from the prior year, from 2014, of $6.5 billion. So that left a net of $18 billion in revenue to support current services this year. As you saw from the prior slide, we were going to spend $24.9, meaning our deficit grew to $6.8. Year-to-year -year growth of $300 million, but growth in the deficit really for the first time in a couple of years since that temporary tax increase passed. Here's how we spend our money, like I said, and if you'll note, it's not just nine out of ten dollars, it's the priorities of the state. So we all know how underfunded K-12 education is. No one here is under any illusion that we put an adequate investment into our public schools, right? Look what the number one thing is that we spend our money on. K-12, early childhood, and higher ed. We're slashing higher ed, we're underfunding K-12, and we're nowhere near adequate on early childhood. And that's our top priority. So can you imagine what we're doing on social services? Think about that. We woefully underfund our number one priority from an expenditure standpoint. That is not good news for the state of Illinois. And I know there's been a lot of rhetoric that the state has been ramping up its expenditures on services ever since it got this temporary tax increase. And anyone who says that, Disingenuous is the kindest word I can use to describe what they're saying. This is our actual expenditures on those four core services over the last few fiscal years in nominal, non-inflation adjusted dollars. We've been cutting. You see one tiny increase up there from fiscal year 2012 to, or excuse me, from 13 to 14. See that little bump? It's two things. In 2012, we tried to cut Medicaid by $2.7 billion, and the feds wouldn't allow that amount of cuts. So we were only able to cut it by 1.6. So that's the restored spending by law we had to put back in because the feds said no. Second part of that, we have something in our budget called group health insurance. It's the health insurance the state carries on public sector workers, right? The state has never, ever budgeted the actual amount of its liability for group health, ever. It's always under budgeted that number just to make it look like they had close to a balanced budget situation. Senate President Cullerton over the last few years has said, nope, it's time to start budgeting the full amount of group health. So we've been incrementally increasing that group health line over the last four years to try to get to where it's accurate. It's still, by the way, under budgeted by two to 400 million. That's it. That's the kick up in that one year. We have been cutting our investment in current services consistently over the last few fiscal years. What has grown is that hard cost line. These are, these are the by law, have to pay, no discretionary costs. If you see, we've separated those hard costs into their three primary categories. The blue bar at the bottom, that's our debt service. You can see we went from zero in debt service to just over $2 billion in debt service. Most of that is pension debt, where we took out pension obligation bonds to make our contribution to the systems, and now we're paying it back. That red bar is that statutory transfer item, like I said, mostly Medicaid, local government distributive fund. That really hasn't changed much. And the gray bar at the top, that's our pension contribution. Well, that's grown. But it's not grown because of benefits. In fact, the normal cost portion of that pension contribution, so what's needed to actually fund benefits for workers, is about 1.2, 1.4 billion. The total line is 6.8. The rest of it's debt service. It's paying back what we didn't put into the pension systems over the last 30 or 40 years, pursuant to a statutory amortization schedule that the state simply can't afford. 
It's irrational. It was passed in 1995. You've all heard about the pension ramp. It was passed then to kick the can down the road to now. So net, 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 what's killing the state and the pension systems is a creature of statute and it's debt we owe ourselves. And if we don't re-amortize that, flatten it out, I've talked about this before, but if we don't do that, you can't solve the pension problem. In fact, it's not a pension problem, it's a debt service problem, and in particular, a debt service repayment problem based on a statutory fiction created to politically kick the can down the road to now. I say maybe we address that. If you want proof that it wasn't benefits or salaries that really drove that increase in our unfunded liability and this big new payment that we're making, here are the numbers from COGFA. Go to the far left. Salary increases have actually been negative. They've contributed, they've actually, we've cut salaries so much at the state level and not hired new employees so much at the state level. They, they've actually decreased the unfunded liability. Then you look at the benefit portion. It's nothing. You add benefits and salaries together, only 7% of the growth in the unfunded liability from 1985 to 2013 was in fact related to benefits. Look at that red bar. That's our underfunding, $45 billion. They're inched at the statutory rate of now just over 7%, but for a long time over 8% compounded annually. That's what's killing us. We're borrowing against and have consistently borrowed against our pension contribution to mask over that structural imbalance that Mike Jacoby talked about when he was up here. For decades, our revenue hasn't grown at a rate that's sufficient to maintain service levels from one year to another, just adjusting for inflation and population changes. So literally, our revenue doesn't support the level of services we provide. Very simple. Now, politicians have refused to deal with tax policy honestly, because it's a politically difficult thing to do. And so, Instead of solving the problem, they borrowed against the pensions, used that revenue to support service delivery for decades, and now we're paying it back. So what taxpayers don't know, media doesn't cover, but I think we should start talking about, is the public pension systems in Illinois have actually subsidized the cost of services consumed by taxpayers for over 40 years. Taxpayers haven't paid the full cost of education, health, social services, and public safety. The pensions have paid for them, at least a portion. Now, by law, we got to pay it back and maybe get our tax levels to the point where we could actually support current services from current revenue. These are the radical changes we need to make. Where I was growing up, these things were called common sense. <laughs> then there's the impact of the temporary tax increase. Well, the green bar shows you what the state's accumulated deficit has actually been over the last few fiscal years, counting the revenue from the temporary tax increase. Now, very interesting, going into 2011, our accumulated deficit was over 14 billion. So we were able to cut it down by six and a half billion or so with the revenue from the temporary tax increase and come out with a deficit of about seven billion. The red bar shows you what our state's accumulated deficit in its general fund would have been if we didn't have that revenue and law otherwise remained the same. In other words, we had this massive increase in payments that we owed to our pension system and we cut spending on core services by well over three and a half billion dollars, which is what we've done. Even with those cuts, that growth in, the, in payments for the unfunded liability would have destroyed our, our fiscal system. In fact, our accumulated deficit last year would have been 31 billion. The entire general fund is 35. It, it really comes down to 
we need fairly raised sustainable revenue to cover our debt service and current service obligations. Here's really a year-to-year -year look at how the revenue gets used from the temporary tax increase. The green bar is the revenue from the temporary tax increase. The little red bar was the service spending cuts for that year, so that's freed up revenue for the year. The yellow bar is payment of past due bills, and the blue bar is the year-to-year -year growth in the debt service. All of the revenue has gone to paying past due bills and growth in debt service. None of it has gone to funding an increase in current services because, in fact, we are cutting current services. That's the data. Here's what the fiscal cliff looks like from the loss of revenue from the temporary tax increase. And you could see over a two-year basis, just go from fiscal year 2014 to 2016, it's going to be a loss of $5 billion occurring revenue over a two-year sequence. And we already have an accumulated deficit of $6.8 billion. It's a revenue problem. And anyone that tries to blame it on spending or runaway spending or whatever, whatever, I, I love who said, you know, we're just simply living beyond our means. Anyone heard that? You know, I'm all for living within your means as long as your means support life. But if, in fact, they don't, maybe you ought to get a little more revenue in the door. Now, my organization is a little bit of an odd duck. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with us, the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, but we are not technically nonpartisan. We are technically bipartisan. So my board of directors does have both Democrats and Republicans who, well, neither like nor trust each other very much. This is just the truth. <laughs> and that's a good thing for the staff because it allows us to focus on best practices and data, right? So we honestly don't care if a particular initiative or proposal happens to be liberal or conservative or somewhere in the We don't care if it's supported by the data, if it matches best practices, if it meets demographically driven needs, then we're for it. If it falls apart on any of those criteria, then we're against it. I've even had board members call, hey, Ralph, can I move you to the left on this or can I move you to the right on this? And my response is the same to my board members. You can't even ask me to consider that. We don't care. And just to show you it's sort of a real life example of how much we don't care, a few years back, on a Monday, we worked with Speaker Madigan to get the EITC passed in Illinois. He is a Democrat, by the way, for those of you who don't know the speaker. <laughs> The very next day, we worked with Republican Senate President Pate Phillip at the time to stop an Emil Jones-led initiative to securitize the politician proceeds and spend them all in one fiscal year, creating a huge fiscal cliff. I think if on day after next to day, you could work with Madigan and Pate, you've pretty much proven your bipartisan Credentials, right? We don't care. Whoever is doing the right thing, we're going to support. So we would support more spending cuts if there were any data at all which suggested spending on services was really a major contributor to or driver of our fiscal problems. There are no such data. The only thing on the spending side of the ledger that's driving fiscal problems is repayment of debt, particularly to the pension systems, not service spending. Here's a little graphic that helps demonstrate that. So if you look at the blue bar, that compares 2015 general fund appropriations for public services to 2000, no adjustments for inflation, nominal dollars. So it looks like in 2015 we're going to spend 19% more, right? But an, as everyone in this room knows, a nominal dollar comparison is absolutely meaningless. It tells you nothing. So we did the radical thing. We adjusted for inflation. And we tried to make a comparison in real terms. That's the middle bar, using the consumer price index. The second you adjust for inflation, what you see is the state is spending significantly less in real terms in the year 2015 than it did in 2000 on education, health, social services, and public safety. Now, that middle bar 
the consumer price index, that's a great sort of inflation metric for the economy as a whole, but it is not the best inflation metric for the public sector. Why? Well, the CPI includes things like, I don't know, Clorox bleach and hair care products. The state government doesn't buy a lot of Clorox bleach, or at least since Blagojevich has been gone, hair care products. <laughs> he was pretty. <laughs> what, what state government buys is labor. Everyone in this room knows public services are labor intensive. Your budget is the cost, in your case, in education of teachers and social, and social workers in the school, aides, et cetera. At the state level, it's the cost of correctional officer salaries and social worker salaries, medical, it, it's labor. So there is an inflation metric tied to the cost of labor, the employment cost index, that's the third bar. So basically, we could buy almost 30% less in public services with what we are planning to invest in 2015 than we did in 2000. That's a pretty significant real cut. And I wanted you to know it's across the board. And look at this. Higher ed is going to get nailed today at noon. Look at what we've been doing to higher ed in real terms over the years. Are you kidding me? Community colleges in particular. I, I mean, these institutions are real economic engines and they are second chance opportunities for those kids that didn't get an adequate K-12 to bring their skill sets up to snuff. We're eviscerating them. Second biggest thing we're cutting, social services. What are we going to hear at noon? Cut higher ed, cut social services. How that could be justified as good policy is just beyond me at this point. There is no rational basis to say cutting these items is a positive thing for the state of Illinois. And I just wanted to, to sort of ram home the point that spending on services isn't our driving problem. All right, we have the fifth largest population and fifth largest economy of any state in America. Depending on the metric we use, we rank either 28th or 36th in spending on those core services. You can't have the fifth largest population and rank 28th or 36th in service expenditures and be high spending. You're not meeting your need. Out of all 50 states, we rank 49th in the number of state workers per capita. Fifth largest population. You got complaints about dealing with state government, not getting what you need? They don't have the capacity. You really have a problem with ISBE. They don't have the capacity. ISBE is woefully underfunded to provide the supports it should be providing to school districts across the state. So here's a three-year look, and, and obviously, you know, we're going to get a very different message today. Remember, I, I started out by saying this is based on a rational approach. So going from 2014 to 2016, if you look at the net funding on services, we said, look, look, what happens if you just want to hold it constant? I mean, we know we're underfunding K-12. We know we're underfunding higher ed. We know we're underfunding social services. We know we've been cutting all these services for the past 15 years. What if we just try to hold it constant in nominal dollars? So a real cut, but in nominal dollars. If we did, with the revenue loss from the phase down of the temporary tax increase, et cetera, our deficit would balloon from 6.8 billion to 12.7. Which is why you're gonna hear a lot about shared sacrifice and blah, blah, blah to justify additional cuts. Shared sacrifice for whom? Sacrifice, Really, those that ain't got are going to get less. That's who's got to sacrifice. You know, we looked at, when we released a report yesterday, we looked at who benefits from the phase down of the temporary tax increase, at least on the individual income tax, the decline from 5% down to 3.75%. You know who benefits? Millionaires. The wealthiest 0.2% of our state population gets an average tax break per year of $37,000 from this phase down. The bottom 50% of taxpayers, they get an average tax cut of 100 bucks. 37 times, excuse me, 
344 times greater for millionaires. In fact, those millionaires, 0.2% of our population, they get about 13.5% of the total tax break to the top. The top 11%, the data, unfortunately, doesn't cut to 10% per 90 because of the way IDOR, the Illinois Department of Revenue, keeps their data. The top 11% get well over 55% of the entire tax break. It's outrageous. Very little of it, nothing really meaningful, flows to middle income and lower income families. Yet which communities do you think will bear the brunt of these cuts? It, it, it's really cynical public policy. And no, it's not going to drive or the economy to growth, et cetera, et cetera. That's just malarkey. How's it worked in Kansas? But if you want to use a tax increase, excuse me, a tax cut to drive economic behavior, what you really want to do is focus on those low and middle income families because they don't save money, they spend it, and our economy is driven by consumer spending. 68 to 70 percent of all economic activity is consumer spending. Yet we're not giving the tax relief to those folks who would spend it. We're giving it to the people at the top who won't. So even if you're just isolating out whether or not this tax relief from this temporary phase down will help stimulate the Illinois economy, it won't, it can't. We're hitting the wrong part of the target. But we'll probably hear about it today. Now I told you Illinois is a relatively large economy. We have a $700 billion annual economy, fifth largest in the nation. But our economic growth on a percentage basis has lagged the U.S. for a long period of time. And what's interesting, this, this goes back 15 years. If you went back 20, it would look worse. If you went back 10, it would still be bad, but not quite as bad. It doesn't matter what period of time you, you pick looking back, Illinois lags, going back to at least 1980, which is when we could get data. But during that whole period we lagged in growth, we also were low tax ranking in the bottom 10 in the nation as a state in total state and local tax burden as a percentage of income. Now we include state and local because if the state doesn't fund something frequently, the local government will step to the plate and fund it. Education being a clear example of that, right? So property taxes in Illinois are relatively high, even though overall tax burden is relatively low because the state just doesn't put enough into education, so locals try to make up the difference. Even including property taxes, and fees and everything else. Illinois ranked in the bottom 10 in the nation during this entire sequence. It, it fell behind the country in economic growth. Bottom 10 in the nation in tax burden. We haven't been a high taxing state. Second lowest taxing state in the Midwest. You have this since here, a period of time here. So Illinois was 42nd in total state and local tax burden. Now we did increase our taxes and that bumped us up to 27th. Still bottom half, still bottom half, still second lowest in the Midwest, all right? We have not become tax Massachusetts if we keep the temporary tax increase. We put another four billion in over where we were before the phase down and we would jump up to maybe 26th. All right. Despite being so low tax, second lowest in the Midwest, look at our economic growth in Illinois, the first full year of recovery coming out of the Great Recession. Second worst. Who was worse? Missouri. Who had lower taxes? Missouri. Why do we keep electing folks who say if we just cut our taxes, the economy will grow? There are no data that support, there are no data which support that contention. The whole supply side approach, really, you have to have the world view of, yeah, that's great in practice, but how's it going to work in theory? Because in bottom line is, it has never worked where implemented. <laughs> never. State or federal level. Yet we continue to elect these, so I don't get it. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on corporate taxes. I'm going to, I'm going to jump through this. But we did increase our corporate income tax rate too, and people said, well, that's what's killed the state. And the answer is no, it hasn't. In fact, right after we made this temporary increase in the corporate income tax, and we bumped it from 4.8% to 7%, 7% being our new rate, 
The governors of Indiana, New Jersey, and Wisconsin all came to Chicago, held press conferences, and said, hey, now that you raised your corporate income tax states, your businesses come flock to our states where we're more business friendly. Every one of those states had a higher corporate income tax rate than our new rate already. Than our new rate! Every single one of them. No one looked. We, we tried to get this information out after the Tribune wrote a big editorial about, look at these governors, and isn't it terrible what, what Illinois is doing? We sent them the numbers and said, guys, write our letter because you got it all wrong, and this, this is a big bunch of hooey. And they refused to print our letter. So there you go. If you want to look at the taxes that businesses pay, you look at the far left part of the graph, what you'll see is it's property taxes, the same taxes individuals pay. Corporate income taxes are literally only about 7% of the total business tax burden in Illinois. It's not a driver of their tax burden. In fact, it's not a driver of business tax burden nationally. We looked at all corporate income taxes paid by all businesses to all 44 states that have a corporate income tax. Pulled it off their federal returns, you can get this data. And then we divided those taxes paid by total corporate taxable income. Actual tax burden is 2.07%. For all businesses, to all 44 states, for all state income taxes. Cutting that, it will have zero stimulative impact. It's too teeny tiny small. This is what we talk about. Getting the state off the back. Really, are you kidding me? I have more data on it, but whatever. I, 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 <laughs> I'm trying to stay on the time deadline. We have complained about this being a jobless recovery. And the justification of cutting business taxes was to free up their income so that they'd start creating jobs. So someone, once again, isn't looking at the numbers. This is the growth in corporate profits through the recession, by the way, and to now, versus growth in national GDP and labor income. The blue bar is corporate profits. Businesses have recovered quite well from the Great Recession. In fact, corporate profits are now at an all-time high. What makes you think freeing up more of their income, especially that tiny 2% of their taxable income that they spend on corporate income taxes, will be that magic straw that breaks the camel back and, and leads to a flood of job growth. Are you kidding me again? No one's looking at the numbers. But here's what we're doing with education. I think, has any of you heard me present before? You are all great Americans. <laughs> this is the actual state foundation level compared to the foundation level recommended by EFAB and the differential. Real quickly, EFAB, the Education Funding Advisory Board, nonpartisan, takes our foundation level and tries to make it meaningful in context of the purchase of an education of a certain quality. Now, their metric is a, is a pretty penurious metric, actually, is what would it cost per child to purchase an education of sufficient quality to get two-thirds of the non-at-risk kids passing tests. We don't care about at-risk kids, and we don't care about one-third of the non-at-risk kids. We just want to get two-thirds of the kids with a reasonable likelihood of academic success and education where they could assumably pass the state exams. Beginning in 03, our actual foundation level was just a little bit less than what EFAB had recommended. Well, now it's over $2,700 less per kid. Per kid. Per kid. My organization is determined, by the way, that that means our level of education funding is inadequate. I'm actually willing to hear the counterpoint. Hearing none, I'm going to move on. So, we have a very inadequate starting point for education. In fact, it's so inadequate that if you run it through the ISBE model, which we have done, we'd have to put about $4 billion more into schools today to just get up to EFAB. So, we're, 
you know, four billion short of a basic quality education. That's not so good. But I think the brilliance of, of the state's foundation level is once they set it at this woefully inadequate level, they then don't bother to pay for it. Because as all of you know, the foundation level is paid up by a mixture of state and local resources by state law and by state formula. So here you can see how Illinois compares to the rest of the nation, National Center on Education Statistics data, in covering the cost of K-12. Uh, go to the state here, Illinois is in the red, the U.S. average is in the blue. You can see Illinois right now is only covering about 28% of the cost of public education from state-based resources. That ranks 50th in the country. The national average is for a state to cover about 46, 47 percent. So then you flip over to the local resource side, property taxes. Well, over 60 percent of the cost of public education in Illinois is covered by property taxes. The national average is 43. By the way, Illinois ranks first there. We are the most reliant state in the nation on property taxes to fund schools. So net, net, net. We have a situation where we don't just have an inadequate education funding system, we have an inequitable one because we've tied the quality of the public education a child's going to receive to the property wealth of the community in which they live. I am on the school board in River Forest District 90. We're a national blue ribbon school and we have all the local property tax resources we need to provide our kids a high quality education and so we do that. In fact, Every year, we just assume we're going to get cut in state funding. We just write that off. But we know we've got the local resources to make up the difference. Move a mile from River Forest to Maywood or Bellwood. Go to Austin. Do you think they've got the local resources? To no. And, and virtually every dollar we spend at River Forest goes into the classroom. Our transportation costs are next to zero. We don't have a bus service for our kids. And I think we have, I'm not sure about this, I think we have a zoning ordinance against poverty. I mean, there's, I mean, we have very, <laughs> very low poverty in River Forest District 90, okay? Other school districts across the state that have lesser resources and greater needs are really in a tough situation. And relying overly on the property tax to fund education is also a very poor way to tax people. So this is inflation adjusted real growth in property taxes versus median income over time. And what you could see is property taxes in Illinois have grown by, you know, well, look, from 1990 to 05 by over 48% in real terms after inflation, whereas median income was up by just over 2%. So you have property taxes growing at close to 20 times the growth for most people's income. That's not really good. And if you factor in the Great Recession period when median income declined, property taxes still continued to grow, you've got a very unfair way to tax people in addition to an inequitable way to fund education. Now, everyone wonders why we're having this problem with our economy. Well, it's not because we overtax ourselves. I hope I made that clear. It is, though, in part because we do underfund education because the correlations between educational attainment and economic viability have never been closer. So for the longest time, there's been a direct line correlation between your educational attainment and your unemployment rate. This chart just shows what I think many of you already know. The far left is less than high school. The far right is a BA or greater. And you can see direct line correlation, the higher your level of educational attainment, the lower your unemployment rate, except maybe for art history majors, and no, no one will help them. The, <laughs> The difference has come, I have a lot of artsy sisters, so I really love saying that. <laughs> the difference in, in the meaningfulness of education and the economy has come on wage. Since 1980, the only cohort of workers in America, generally Illinois specifically, that have seen their incomes increase at a rate greater than inflation actually have a college degree, period. Could be a two-year degree but you gotta have that piece of paper to be economically viable in the modern economy, which is why it's so brilliant that we're slashing higher ed spending in Illinois right now. The other thing we know about wages is the wage gap between whites and minorities in Illinois is getting worse over time, not better. 
So you look at that first line, the wage gap between whites and Latinos has grown by some 46% since 1980 in Illinois. Some of that is because of our problems with education funding and all that, but some of it's neutral labor market forces at play because with Latinos here are a couple of factors that contribute to the growth in wage gap. You have a significant immigrant population willing to take very low paying jobs. You have as a second language issues. And in fact, as a cohort in the labor force, Latinos happen to be both the youngest overall and the least educated overall cohort. Well, if you're young and undereducated, those are both indicia of being qualified for only a lower paying job. So there are a number of neutral labor market forces at play here. Then you jump down to the growth in the wage gap between whites and blacks of over 90% over this period. So let's just start with the harsh reality. As far as neutral labor market forces go, there's nothing. There's only two things happening here. Discrimination in labor markets, and it doesn't matter how you slice the data, you come up with racially disparate outcomes that can only be explained through discrimination still impacting the labor market. And how we fund public education. Remember, we've tied the quality of public education you're gonna get in Illinois to the property wealth of the community in which you live. 55% of our African-American children live in the 5% of school districts with the greatest poverty and the lowest property values. 83% of our African-American kids live in school districts with a concentrated low income level is 30% or greater, hence very low property values. And as everyone in this room knows, low income becomes a real high cost factor in a school district at 25%. So net, 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 what this has meant is our starting point for public education funding is woefully inadequate. And then African Americans on average start off at about $1,500 below that per kid, per school year, K through 12. Well, if education matters more than ever to being competitive in a current economy, and you single out a group of your population for a particularly poorly funded education, they're simply not going to be competitive with their peers for going on and credentialing themselves and being high-end earners. And that's what's happening. So net, 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 our, our decisions on tax policy and education funding policy have created a structure that is inadequate for the vast majority of school children and has particularly singled out minorities for a woefully funded public education. Why change that? I mean, you know, we, we know this stuff. The data are compelling and clear. And what it takes to fix it is changing tax policy. So this is the picture of the structural deficit Mike Jacoby talked about. It's just, if you start with the assumption the state has a balanced budget, which we did start with in the beginning of the year, this comparison, which is 2012, I think. I can't really see because my glasses don't allow me to. And you just adjust for inflation and population growth and you assume a normal economy. This is the gap between cost growth versus revenue growth. The red bar is our revenue, current law on revenue. You could see that we have a dip down, there's the cliff, when, as the phase down of the temporary tax increase gets implemented, and then growth. The green bar, can you see that green bar? That's our cost bar, it's two things. It's our debt service cost, we don't adjust that for anything, that's just what it, whatever it is, it is, we know the payments. And then our current level of services adjusted for historic rates of inflation and population growth assuming a normal economy, just like we adjust revenue. So the gap between the red bar and the green bar is the growth in our structural imbalance between our revenues, our service costs, and our debt obligations. We're not sustainable. Now the green bar understates our debt service obligations because it assumes the pension reform, reform, bill that passed last year is constitutional, it is not. It's already been ruled unconstitutional, it will again be ruled unconstitutional at the Supreme Court level. I testified to that effect when they passed the bill, I said don't pass this, it's unconstitutional, but hey, what do I know? So, once it's finally ruled unconstitutional at the Supreme Court level, our cost bar goes up to that blue bar. That's the full pension ramp that we currently have. Which is why you can't solve our problem unless you're anti debt. A big part of that growth is pensions. The yellow bar, by the way, that would be our revenue if we don't let the temporary tax increase phase down. 
So this is just going to give you an example of what reamortizing that pension debt can accomplish. And I really need the entire management alliance to start beating up legislators on both sides of the aisles to make this happen because it's eminently doable politically. There's even some discussion that Rauner will mention it today in his budget address. So this is one thing we need to make happen. The red bar is the current law on repaying the debt we owe the pension system. It's a creature of statute. It's a complete fiction. It was the kick of the can politically down the road to now. I'm pretty good on tax policy. I can't design a tax system that jumps in revenue like that from year to year and allow us to make those payments and fund current services. I just can't do it. The other three lines you see there Different ways to re-amortize that debt over time. You see, we, we have a little phase up to it to get to a level dollar amount. And then that's all the state pays on its debt. Each of these scenarios that we've modeled out here accomplishes two things. It gets the state's funded ratio to a healthy level. Within 30 years, about 78% funded your considered healthy by the Congressional Budget Office at 80%, and within 43 years, by the way, 100% funded. So it accomplishes that. It gets you to a healthy funded ratio while meeting all cash flow obligations of the systems to current and future retirees. It requires zero in benefit cuts, which is good because that would be unconstitutional, more benefit cuts. It also costs slightly less than the current ramp because it pays a little bit more up front. And the magic of compounding interest, you save a few billion dollars over. There's not a lot, a billion, two, three billion. But net, 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 it works. And look at how much revenue it will end up freeing up for current service expenditure. This is one of the key things that we need to have happen. And I think it's politically doable, and hopefully all of you will support it. Now, obviously, uh, we then have to fix tax policy. And for taxes to work in a modern economy, they have to be fair, responsive, stable, and efficient. They are none of those things in Illinois we're 0 for 4. <laughs> One tax reform that Governor Rauner has put on the table, and it's doubtful he's going to mention it today from what I'm hearing, but he may, is expansion of the sales tax base to include some services. We have to do this, folks. It, it's one of the core things we need to do to fix our fiscal policy. Of the 45, 46 states right now that have a broad sales tax that applies to a lot of their economy, we have the most narrow base. And the reason is, is we don't really tax services. And that won't. You just go to the 2012. So what we do tax is the sale of products. The red bar shows you over time how much of our Illinois economy was made up of the sale of products, what we do tax. It's going down. It's now only 17% of the Illinois economy. What we don't tax, services, that's the blue bar, it's now over 70% of the Illinois economy. You just can't leave the largest and fastest growing segment of your economy out of your tax base and expect you're gonna have sustainable revenue to fund services over time, you're not. So net, 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 we have to do this. And once again, this will not make us tax Massachusetts. All of our neighboring states, including Missouri, tax services more than we do today. Iowa and Wisconsin, as a matter of fact, tax every service we think you should tax, which are consumer services. We wouldn't go after business to business. We wouldn't go after professional for a number of reasons. But you would go after consumer service, haircuts, lawn care, bowling, health clubs, auto repair, consumer services. That alone would generate $2.5 billion, roughly, for the Illinois economy and would grow over time. $2.5 billion. It's a big part of the solution, and we have to do it. Then there's retirement income. This is really one of my favorite subjects because it's not at all controversial to talk about taxing retirement income. <laughs> but we have to tax some of it. There are 41 states in America that have an income tax, and we are one of only four that fully excludes all retirement income from taxation. Even the federal government taxes most retirement income, including Social Security income, by the way, taxes most of that. We determined that if, okay, a taxpayer has $50,000 a year or less in adjusted gross income, we'll allow them to keep the full exemption 
No retirement income will be taxed for these people. So you're not going after low income seniors or fixed income seniors, right? And then phase in your taxation. The next level of income, you know, 50 to 75,000 in AGI will tax 25% of your retirement income on up. If we did that at 5%, that's 1.2 billion. We've now got, between our sales tax base expansion and the taxation of retirement income, enough revenue when coupled with the, fa the re amortization of the pension bill to solve every fiscal problem in Illinois. We just did it. So I'm not gonna get into the fair taxation thing here because I've gone over my time. Taxation in Illinois, unfair right now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's focus one more time on these arguments that raising taxes at any level ruins your economy. I told you there are no data to support this and I just am gonna give you more and more examples of it. So 41 states, as I mentioned, have an income tax. Nine do not. This is a comparison in economic over the last 10 years, the last decade, between the nine states in America that are depicted in the red that have no income tax at all at the state level and the nine states in America that not only have an income tax but have the highest rates in their income tax, the highest taxing tax states. And as you can see, there's no discernible difference in a material way in economic growth. You go to average unemployment rate per year, 6.1% to 6%. Statistical tie, no big difference. You look at change in real median income over the sequence. Well, the high tax states actually did a little better. They lost 4.2% of income. The no tax states lost more, but a statistical tie, 4.2 to 4.5%, really not meaningful. And then you look at growth in per capita GDP, that's on the far right, and you could see that the high tax states actually had 8.2% growth in state GDP over the sequence, which is statistically better than what happened in the no tax states. And it's not because they were high tax states, it's because of how they used their tax revenue. They invested it in education and infrastructure, which are the two things that do have a statistically meaningful correlation to a state growing its economy on a competitive basis over time. Illinois is cutting those things. And finally, even at the federal level, for the supply siders out in our audience, there is no correlation between what you do with tax policy, in particular tax cuts, and growing your national economy. So this is our national economy mapped out against certain tax level decisions federally. What you see is the first little circle there in the far left is the George Bush senior tax increase. You see, he, after saying, read my lips, I won't increase taxes, increase taxes, and the economy grew. And the next little blip is the Bill Clinton tax increase. The economy not only grew, it peaked. Then post that peak, we went into a mild recession as the dot-com boom went away and all those little businesses exploded. And we got the administration of George W. Bush. He cut taxes in 2001 and nothing happened. He accelerated that tax cut in 03, made it much bigger and much faster, and the economy tanked. And that doesn't even include the Great Recession. So net, 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 it's not tax policy, frankly, that was driving what was happening in America's economy. Other things mattered more. This doesn't say you tax yourself to prosperity. This says, your taxes aren't the driver of your economy. Other things are. So what's important about taxes is getting them right. Which brings us to Illinois. We don't. But we can solve our problems in a politically viable way that will not only let the state pay all its past due bills, but within three years, start funding education up to that four and a half, five billion more that it needs to provide a meaningful opportunity to learn to every child in our state whether or not they are at risk and whether or not they are fortunate enough to live in River Forest or in Austin or in East St. Louis. I say that's what we should pursue as public policy and I appreciate you listening to me here today. You're watching the Illinois Channel. 
an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 